Can I just talk for a minute? Would that be all right? Cool. I don't know uh, what I miss out with all of you in the back row. I'm sure very funny things are said, but if you would sit up further, you could have heard a really funny thing today. Uh, Isaac was telling the children's story, and he said, what do you think was in the, sur- in the, the thermos? And Peter pipes up and says, coffee? <laughs> you, just, you just have to be in proximity if you're going to hear these kinds of things. So next week, consider sitting up a little closer to Peter. You'll get these wonderful little <laughs> quiet quips that will make you laugh and make your Sabbath day special. Uh, it always makes mine special. Well, we have some birds at our house that are absolutely going crazy. Um, They have found a nest that was already built on top of a speaker underneath our patio. Now, this is a hazard zone, right? Because the speaker they've chosen to make uh, their home is actually right next to our back door, which we go in and out of frequently. And we have sort of a curtain partition around the uh, patio, so they have to navigate when those curtains are open and closed. And then there is a fan inside as well that could act very much like a bird blender if we're not all careful. And so these particular birds uh, have, have, have made it home, and, and Jill and I were talking about how the birds are going crazy this time of year and how gorgeous it is. And... Um, she said, why, did they, why are they back? I said, honey, it's all about your three favorite words, move in condition, you know? <laughs> they have found a home, it is move in condition, and they are ready to rent. And so uh, we're enjoying watching these gorgeous birds. Uh, um, I hope you're enjoying the same this spring. Saw something on Facebook that I liked this week. I've had a little extra time lately. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Somebody posted that, uh, uh uh-oh, it's winter in California, and they showed a guy in shorts with sandals, but he had socks on under his sandals. (laughs) I hope you've got your winter wardrobe on and are ready for the uh, cold that we've experienced. uh, This this It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Other places in the country facing minus 7 degrees and 15 feet of snow and and whatnot. We're here ready to uh, take our jackets off because it's going to be 85 degrees today. What what wonderful grace uh, we are at the moment enjoying. People say that they really long for heaven, and I think it's much harder for Southern Californians to long for heaven because we kind of almost already live there. I just think this is, it's such an irony because there are people in other parts of the world that consider California just to be sheer evil all in its own. It's under judgment and one day it's going to break off on the San Andreas Fault and just slide into the sea and we'll all get what we deserve, basically. You know, to live in California, to be a Southern California particular, to some people in some parts of the country is tantamount to a, uh, playing um, Monopoly and getting the card that says, go to hell, straight to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. I mean, that's, that's pretty much uh, how some people view it. But I think we live in heaven and are actually much closer to God here than the rest of the country. So I thought, we, we can take the opposite view, right? It's a pluralistic society, we can have our point of view. Well, I was gone last weekend. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I spent a little time in Kaiser, West L.A. Um, some of you are aware that I have been sick for five weeks or so. Um, and I'm not through it all yet. My energies are not quite what they should be. So if uh, I don't quite seem my usual self, I apologize for that. I contracted what's called C. diff colitis after taking some antibiotics. And the stuff can kill you. Uh, Fortunately, I've been responding well to the treatment and uh, seem to be on the mend. But it makes you want to not eat. It makes you want to... It it really wipes you out. And so uh, I'm I'm glad I could rest last weekend. I'm grateful to Rick Rothler for preaching for me. Thank you, Rick, stepping in. Uh, He's got a lot of places to be on Sabbath. And so for him to uh, short notice say, yeah, I'll take take your pulpit was was meaningful and, and helpful to me. And I appreciate your prayers, and I appreciate your prayers going forward because it will be weeks, even uh, months, before this is all fully 
resolved and dealt with, and so I just pray that I can stay strong and move forward. There's someone else who covets your prayers. I got to spend about an hour and a half with Brad Greaves yesterday, and uh, he's in Kaiser um, Sunset, and uh, many of you know him, some of you don't. Many of you know Irene and uh, uh, Derek and Alex, they're, they're boys. Um, the family's staying strong, but as you know, uh, Brad has uh, um, pancreatic cancer, and his prognosis is not terribly good. The, the ideal scenario would be that the chemotherapy he's undergoing would shrink the tumor to the point that it's operable, and that that would be a life-saving uh, step. That would be the most optimal thing that could happen. Uh, other than that, it's a matter of life extension and palliative care and uh, family is surrounding him. But I was sitting with him and at the end of the visit I said, Brad, what, what, what can I do for you? And he looked at me and he said something that um, really brought tears to my eyes. He said, pray. And I wanted to communicate with you, all of you, how very much your prayers matter to Brad Greaves today how very much you taking a few minutes in your day and lifting your heart and being in solidarity with someone who is very ill and uh, remembering them to your Father in Heaven, how very valuable that is as a practice and how meaningful that is for people. Uh, I was surprised to learn that Brad is one of the four people who watch us online. We have a huge following, we have four or so people who, who track this. And, and I, I, I wanted to just communicate this publicly because this is the kind of thing that your church budget giving funds and we actually need to up the ante. Somebody needs to chip in 50 bucks more a month or something because Brad was saying sometimes he can't get through a sermon because the commercials kick on and it doesn't real spool back very naturally to the the sermon. And so we have a, a commercial account right now, one that, that's free so that they run all these ads during my sermon. I have no idea what they're running ads for. It could be, you know, depends undergarments for all I know. Um, so we, we might want to consider getting an ad free account where it just streams uh, straight forward, but we'll need a few more dollars to make that happen. He also had some sermon suggestions, so watch out. I'm going to be talking about. Uh, when really tough things happen to innocent people, to good people, and, and how we deal with suffering and pain, um, what our expectations of God might or ought to be, uh, that'll be something for us to talk about down the road. So uh, continue to pray for him, continue to pray for me, and for all who uh, have been ill and, and suffer, and thank you very much for that and your, uh, your understanding as I've, I've been down this week. I'm going to uh, take a few minutes to talk about our theme at this point. We are in our year with God. Um, actually, it's supposed to be much more than that. I'm hoping it is uh, something we spool into a lifetime of, of purposeful living with God and paying attention to uh, what that is all about. One of the uh, possibilities for a text to read today was the Ten Commandments. And I refrained from doing it because I thought we all know them. We all understand them. We've all read them. They're a, a clear revelation, but they're not a particularly complex revelation. Jesus complexifies it for us a little bit when he says, you've heard it said that thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, if you hate your brother, you've killed him. You've committed murder already. You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. Jesus complexifies the Ten Commandments for us because he takes it out of the realm of actual behavior, that is to say, what we literally end up doing, and moves it into the realm of what it is that we might be thinking or our motivations the heart of the matter, the interior. He takes it from something extrinsic and moves it to something intrinsic. Either way, we live in a culture that is challenged to relate. When I grew up, there was a lot of talk of sin. 
Just very quickly, you raise your hand, say yes, whatever you want to do. Uh, be silent because that's the style of many of you. Um, how many of you were raised with a lot of talk of sin and guilt? So some of you can relate to that. Some of you were not raised with talk of sin and guilt, but I was raised in that environment which there was lots of talk of sin and guilt. And the phenomena that I've observed as I've as I've aged and as I've gone through time, is that we've moved from a society in which that was a language most everybody spoke, whether they were churched or not churched, Christian or something else, the language of sin and guilt seemed to be fairly universal, at least to my experience. Perhaps not completely universal, but fairly universal. And those who didn't adopt it or agree with it, um, these libertines, if you will, these uh, radicals in society, we, we all kind of knew where they stood. There was a group of people that rejected all of that, but we kind of knew who they were and where they stood. Well, we've moved through time, and we've complexified our understanding of how things are, you see. We now, when we think about things, we don't just look at a behavior. We're looking at the psychology of the behavior. What is it that motivates somebody? What is it in their background that might predispose them to this particular problem or affectation or issue or sin, to use the old-fashioned word, or habit or addiction? We're prone to look now at things in terms of systems, right? Certainly you've heard of family systems, we have a much more societal view of the problems that we have. We've expanded these sorts of things. And individual responsibility, while still there, is somewhat diminished because we recognize that in the complexity of factors that go into behavior, we're influenced by things beyond ourselves. It's this complexity that we're talking about. We've also come to recognize that things that were very cleanly black and white for us as children or in a certain sort of frame of moral thinking become less black and white as we move through the stages of moral thinking. We've been less inclined to be arbitrary as, as we've gained education and seen the world through more complex lenses. We've also come to an understanding philosophically that how we view the world is through a particular lens, and that is the lens of our culture, the lens of our being, the lens of our understandings. We don't purely apprehend anything. We have our senses, we take in the input, but there's always an interpretive layer. There's always a framework from which we interpret an event. And this is how we get into trouble in communication, isn't it? Especially email. Have you ever had, you've sent off an email that was just perfectly neutral in your point of view, perfectly okay, nothing in the world wrong with this email, and somebody on the other end took offense? Have you ever done that? They felt that your tone wasn't right in the email. You were being maybe too stern, or you were too abrupt, or you were too something. Have you ever had? No? Okay, it's fine. It's all right. I'm, I am the only emailer in the group, I see. Matt, you identify? You've had that happen? Well, yeah, and people Yeah, it happens. Don't handle conversations like that through email. Yeah, you've got to say less, not more sometimes. Although that can get you into trouble too, because why are you being so brief with me? Are you angry? You see? So we have these lenses that we read even our email through. We interpret them, and we can have one communicator meaning one thing on one side and another communicator meaning another thing on another side, and we start to realize how complex it is when all of us have different filters and lenses. This is why preaching is a miracle, by the way. Do you want to know how we know that God is here every week? Because every week, almost all of you walk away with something. That's a miracle. It isn't me, 
It isn't my cleverness or my words. It is a work of the Holy Spirit because it is hilarious to me. I don't ever call them on it, but I'll be standing out in the lobby and someone will come say, I just loved how you talked about X, Y, Z. That was so meaningful for me. It's nowhere in the sermon. I never talked about X, Y, Z. I only talked about D, E, F, okay? See, something happened in the translation, in the transmitting of that message. I sent out DEF and they heard XYZ. Why was that? Because they didn't need DEF. DEF wasn't going to be understandable for them. DEF wasn't going to edify or lift them up or build them up or make them better people or more whole or ease something that was going on in their minds. And the Holy Spirit had to intervene and come in and help them hear XYZ. That's the miracle of preaching. But we come at communications with a lens. Excuse me just a second. My mouth gets dry after, with all the antibiotics I'm on. We come at at, at this with filters. And so this whole idea of sin, which seems very black and white, has slowly just sort of sloughed away in our society. It's been replaced with language of sickness, with language of addiction, and I'm not sure that's entirely inappropriate. Okay? We're educated people. I don't know that that's entirely inappropriate. But something has happened in Western consciousness because we no longer think in terms of personal responsibility and sin and guilt And we no longer conversely then think of the remedy that's available to us in Christ through the Christian message. And that is, he says quite simply, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is only meaningful if you have an understanding of sin. doesn't matter otherwise. What do I need a cleansing for if I'm not guilty of anything? What do I need a savior for if there's nothing to save me from? The whole enterprise gets chucked and put aside if we can't come to some terms of personal responsibility and guilt and all of that. So we're going to talk just for a few minutes yet about this problem and the solution in light of of society today and our scriptures and hit a couple of different things that might be might be interesting for you or hopefully interesting for you so to begin i'm going out of sequence with what was read but i would like to start with the gospel story john chapter 2 13 to 22 this is the story of jesus cleansing the tabernacle and it's part of the liturgical journey for us as we move toward, toward Easter time. In this story of cleansing the temple, Jesus is overcome with passion for the temple and, and acts in a seemingly violent way to raise awareness and to change what is happening. He physically takes a rope of cords, a whip of cords, and moves into the space. He physically drives out animals from the courtyard. He physically frees birds. He physically tosses over money changers' tables. It's a very chaotic sort of scene that he creates here. And he's filled with passion, holy rage, if you will, outrage, if you will. And he, he moves through this and is finally, when it's all disrupted and done, he's confronted. What are you doing? And his answer has been, as he's, as he's been about this process, he's been saying in a loud voice, I'm sure, why have you taken this house of prayer and turned it into a marketplace? Why have you taken sacred space and tainted it with the profane? 
Why have you taken this place of gift and offering and taken it to a level of usury? You're selling people who've come to the temple inferior products. You're charging them to exchange their money for your money. You're charging them excess prices to have a sacrifice to offer. You're not doing justly. You're not loving mercy. You're not walking humbly with God. Why have you taken this place of sacred hope, of confession and release, of forgiveness and grace, of sacrifice, if you will? And why have you profaned it as a market? Jesus takes what's going on and turns it upside down. The religious system had grown complacent and blind where this was concerned. And he, in his zeal, understood something. This wasn't about ministry. This was about something much deeper and greedier and more dangerous. This story illustrates to me not only a cleansing that takes place of the temple literally in Jesus' time, but prefigures the cleansing of the temple that he will do as our high priest in Hebrews. It prefigures this whole sacrificial system that while he's addressing the animals and the birds that are there in the courtyard that people sacrificed, he himself will someday very soon be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He himself will tear down the temple and raise it up in three days. An outrageous statement, a blasphemous statement. It had taken 46 years to build that temple. It had taken the resources of Rome to build that temple. By the way, the more I study Rome, the more interesting it is. The Roman Empire, what they were able to accomplish, what they did, it's, it's stunning, actually, to see what, what they were able to accomplish. But Jesus is addressing something much deeper and something more spiritual. His body will be crucified and resurrected in three days, and this is the temple that he's speaking about. And so you see a transference that's twofold. There's a transference to the body as temple instead of the temple as a location. And now what does the trading in that temple look like? What sort of corruption might we make by way of analogy to the human body. And then it goes beyond that, and it goes to Christ our high priest, as I was saying in Hebrews. One who will cleanse the temple. One who will rid the world of sin once for all. One in whom we have our hope. That's our gospel reading today, our gospel story. Our New Testament reading is Paul writing about the power of the cross. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, saved from what? We're being saved from sin. But if that's not a part of our language and not a part of our consciousness and not a part of our thinking, The question remains, saved from what? And here's where Paul is relevant, very relevant. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate, he quotes. For where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Here's a perspective. Here's the lens we might consider adopting. Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? See, the world really wants to tell us all the time there's nothing wrong with you. There's Things are the way they are. We do what we do. We're human. This is the message of the world. You're okay, I'm okay. Or just as often, I'm okay and you're not quite right. Only everybody thinks that, right? So where does that leave us? God takes, Jesus takes this this, uh, idea, or, or Paul does, takes this idea of Christ being crucified and the cross 
this anathema becoming wisdom of God, becoming healing of God, grace of God, salvation for us. Because to the Jews it was an anathema, and to the Greeks it was foolishness. It wasn't wisdom. They sought wisdom. And Rome was a Hellenized or Greek-cultured world. Makes you think, doesn't it? What is the wisdom of this age that God would declare foolishness? What is the thing that we hold to that might be reshaped if we were to view it through the cross of Jesus Christ, through his brokenness? Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I love the uh, hyperbole there. God is neither foolish nor weak. But Paul uses this as a contrast to describe that God in whatever weakness we might find in God is always stronger than we are. And God by whatever foolishness we might account to God is always more wise than we are. And the cross becomes his chosen instrument of communicating his love and grace. And none of it makes any sense if we don't have sin and don't need a Savior. And so we get to our psalm, which is a work of sheer genius. Allow me. Take a moment and turn to your Bible in this, because I really want you to visually see the words Your pew Bible, it's 507 and 508, Psalm 19. Or if you have your personal Bible, you probably know right where this is. This is a passage we're pretty familiar with, actually. And yet I think we often neglect how absolutely beautiful it is. The psalmist starts out with declaratives based in creation. First of all, the heavens. And that's another problem with modernity, isn't it? Not only do we not see the stars at night because of the pollution in our cities, but we live in cities. We drive on concrete. We walk, uh, we drive on asphalt. We walk on concrete. We have leveled floors. We have, you know, it, it's a freaky thing if we get a spider in our house, right? We, 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 we live very isolated from nature and from the world around us. And we tame what is around us. We landscape and hedge and put fences up, and then the next neighbor does the same thing. It's kind of a wild thing if we find a bobcat in our backyard or a skunk or a possum. or Wow, nature, it's out there somewhere. But for the psalmist, the world was a different place, and he was much more connected to the world as it was created as we've become, he was probably as connected to that as we've become distanced from that. And he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And let's just go through a few words here real quickly. They declare, they pour forth speech, they proclaim, they reveal knowledge. That's verses 1 and 2. Do you see it? Let me do it again. They declare, they proclaim, they pour forth speech, and they reveal knowledge. Well, to me, that is on the one hand, revelation, and on the other hand, confession. The whole universe confesses the Creator's intent and being and purpose. Verse 3, there's no speech from the heavens, per se, that the psalmist identifies, but he says, the voice goes out into all the world nonetheless, and the words to the ends of the world. This testimony, this confession, this revelation, silent, but conveying wisdom and knowledge and testimony. This has made an analogy for what is revealed in creation is revealed even more in the law. Romans 1, Paul will pick this theme up and say, what advantage is it to be a Jew of great advantage? because you have the revealed law. And in this case, the psalmist is dealing with the Ten Commandments. He's dealing with the Torah. He has not yet had the privilege of hearing Jesus preach, who's expanded and complicated this for us. But to the psalmist, this is what he has to say. The law is perfect, trustworthy, 
right, radiant, pure, enduring, firm, and righteous. Pretty unequivocal, isn't it? There's something very straightforward about that declaration. The law is not just good. It's all of these things. It refreshes. It makes wise. It gives joy. It gives light. Those are all things we would want. But we'll read in Paul a little later that the law is what convicts us. It's been added so that sin might be known. It's what tells us that we haven't quite achieved. We haven't measured up. While we may have physically managed to keep most of the ten, when we get to Jesus' expansion, we know we have not managed at all. For we have hated, and we have coveted, and we have lusted, and we have wanted. Verse 10, they're more precious than gold, than pure gold. There are television shows about finding gold, finding gold in the Amazon, finding God in the uh, Netherlands, not Netherlands, uh, Greenland, excuse me. Uh, all these sorts of things, these adventures, people trying to find gold because it's precious. Advertisements on television, I've got my PhD in television watching this last month. Um, for turning your old jewelry in for cash, gold. Something precious, something sweet, something wonderful. Ah, and here we get to the crux of the matter in verse 12. But who can discern their own errors? That is the core of the problem. The psalmist doesn't even try to answer it. Brilliantly, he goes on to the confession, Lord, forgive my hidden faults and keep me from willful sin that they may not rule over me. What does that sound like? Addiction? Entrapment? Slavery? All metaphors we've used for sin. May we be the opposite. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord. The opposite. I've run out of time. I didn't think that would happen this morning. I didn't think I had the energy to go 20 or 30 minutes, but here I am. I have half a dozen texts to take you through, but I'm going to pull up two. Let's go to Leviticus 5, verse 5. Leviticus 5, verse 5. When anyone realizes their guilt in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. And as a penalty for the sin they have committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. Must confess. They must make right. They must bring an atoning offering. Go to James chapter 5. There are lots of other texts we could point to. I might take you to one more. But James 5, this wonderful passage. I'm looking at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, for the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know the context. This prayer of faith, this passage that we read when people are sick or coming to life's end, perhaps, this prayer that goes with anointing. And there at the end it says, confess your sins to one another. Psalm 38, 18 is another great one if you have a minute to write that down. Or Proverbs 28, 13. Confession becomes the solution when we recognize the problem. And the problem is one you're very familiar with. We have a perfect law and an expanded law. We have a culture that individualizes everything, 
systematizes everything and structurally names everything in a way that makes it difficult for us to think in terms of personal responsibility. And we have brokenness in our relationships between with ourselves, in our families, in our friendships, in our society, and in our world. And we continue to do great harm to one another on this planet We're broken. There's no two ways around it. And when we pause for a moment and not embrace that and revel in it and reflect on it all day long, no. But when we recognize it and when we begin to think it through with our God, confession becomes the avenue of freedom. Confession becomes that place where we find the grace of forgiveness and the hope of eternity. Confession becomes that place where what has been attributed to us gets nailed to a cross on which our Savior died 2,000 years ago. Confession becomes the point of release and freedom and hope and peace, and it's a language we've lost. But I hope as we journey with God, it will be something that you bring back into your personal lexicon. I hope it'll be something you bring back into your own thinking, because as you journey with God, the power of confession will make a difference in your life. As you journey with one another, the power of confession will make a difference in your life. God has been so good to us and so gracious to us. Freely he's given himself to us. And now I would invite you responsively to give back of your tithes and offerings as our deacons wait upon us and as we conclude this service.